Joining us this week as we explore the promise and pitfalls of the information age is Don Tapscott, author of 14 books, most recently Macroeconomics, Rebooting Business and the World. Hi, Don. Hello. How Great to be you? here. I'm, I'm well. Okay, so Macroeconomics is the follow-up to your 2007 bestseller, Wikonomics. What are we talking about? What does Macroeconomics mean? Well, a wiki is just a bit of software that enables a lot of people to co-edit a document. But it's become a metaphor for collaboration, and collaboration that can occur on an astronomical scale. So Wikinomics was about the art and science of harnessing this power of mass collaboration. And we argued that the internet is not about eyeballs, stickiness, page views, clicks, dot coms, or anything like that. It's a, it's a global platform that radically drops collaboration costs, and that's changing the corporation. Now, macroeconomics is arguing that it's not just the corporation that's changing, that every institution in society is going through a profound transformation right now, and that we're entering a whole new age. The industrial age has finally run out of gas. Well, I want to talk about the industrial age and the shift to that from for thousands of years in an ag agrarian society. That was such a fundamental shift, the change from agrarian to industrial. What lessons can we take from that shift that relate to us now? Well, that's actually a good place to start. Uh, it's not in 1991 or 82 or something like this. You need to go back a few hundred years. And back then, all around the world, we had agrarian societies and the, and the political and economic system was called feudalism. And knowledge was concentrated in a tiny oligopoly. People just, they didn't know about things. There was no concept of progress. You were born and you died. But Johannes Gutenberg came along with this great invention, the printing press. And over time, people began to acquire knowledge. And when they did, the institutions of agrarian society started to appear to be stalled or frozen or in atrophy. Or, or inadequate or failing. It, it didn't make sense for the church to be responsible for medicine, for example. It didn't make sense for a bunch of kings and nobles to be running everything. So we saw the rise of parliamentary democracy, the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther called the printing press God's highest act of grace. We saw the creation of the, the corporation, the university of science, and eventually the industrial revolution. And it was all good. It advanced our, our standard of living around the world. And now is this as big a shift? I mean, that was paradigmatic. It to was use a very big <laughs> word. Uh, is this as big the shift now to the digital age? Well, I think it is. That we're to see change, a turning point in history here. That that once again the technology genie is out of the bottle. Only this time it's very different than the printing press. See, the printing press gave us access to the written word. The internet enables each of us to be a publisher. The printer, uh, the printing press gave us access to recorded knowledge, the internet gives us access to the, the, not just the knowledge, but the intelligence contained in the crania of other people around the world real time on a global basis. And, and, and this is taking us into a new age. It's not an information age. It's an age of networked intelligence. And collaboration is fundamentally changing every institution in society. Give me some examples of, practical examples of what's changing. Well, if you look around, you see all these institutions today that are in various stages of being stalled or failing or in atrophy, contrasted with these sparkling new initiatives that show the contours of a whole new model. Like what? Well, take something like newspapers. Seventy have gone bankrupt in the United States in the last decade. As one youngster said to us, if the news is important, it will find me. And young people are informed today, pretty much, but they don't read newspapers. So the problem that newspapers uh, existed to, to solve, well, we don't need them anymore. So on the other hand, and, and this is a big problem because we're all on a New York Times death watch, you know, how much longer can it service its debt? But on the other hand, we have these amazing new models of how we get informed that are based on, on the internet that solve many of the problems we need to solve. Like we need to have quality, good journalism, and we need to have balance so that we're not all in these little self-reinforcing echo chambers where all we hear is our own point of view and, and the purpose of information is to, to give us uh, comfort you know, rather than, than to inform us. The newspaper would be one, but we have science, the university is, is losing its monopoly on higher education, the old model of a corporation typified by General Motors, it went bankrupt. So 
Yeah, we're going to talk about education yeah. later in the week. You did mention, however, that business is, fun is, is fundamentally changing as well. Yeah. What are we talking about? Is, is it the, the people, the institutions? What is the shift really about? Well, the shift is fundamentally about how we get capability to do things. Like the old model of the industrial age corporation, it was called vertical integration. Everything was inside the boundaries of the corporation. Well, now companies focus on what they do best and they build networks to do the rest. So talent can be outside the boundaries of a company. So Procter & Gamble is looking for a molecule that will take red wine off a shirt, okay? Say. So you do the math. They have 7,000 chemists inside their boundaries, but they have a million outside that they can now get to. And they're organized into what we call idea agoras, like the Roman and Greek agora market. But they're markets for ideas. They're markets for, for uniquely qualified minds. And sure enough, there's a retired chemist in Oakville or a grad student in Taipei that comes up with a molecule. PNG pays them. So 60% of all of their innovation now comes from outside the boundaries of the corporation. And this is a change in, in the architecture of, of the firm, and, and that's the foundation of how we create wealth. You know, you're smiling. You sound excited when you talk about this shift. And let me play the skeptic for a minute. I mean, this is, could be seen as sort of scary, this rapid change. What are the pitfalls of, of such rapid change? Well, this is causing a big disruption. And when you have a shift like this, it is a paradigm shift, um, these things cause dislocation and confusion and uncertainty. And they're nearly always received with uh, coolness or, or worse, mockery, hostility, and vested interests fight against change. And there's a lot that we don't know exactly how this is all going to unfold. But many people say, we don't know anything. I don't think that's true. In macroeconomics, we describe the shape and the contours of a new model of science or a new model of a, what our, our transportation systems uh, could look like and so on. But the, the big problem and the biggest danger here is that leaders of old paradigms have great difficulty embracing the new, and they're resisting this change. And companies that are doing that are tending to fall behind and eventually they will, they will fail as well. Is this, um, you know, those who don't choose to change will be forced to change or do they lose out in the grand scheme of things? Well, both happens. I think that uh, right now you can look at uh, companies that are struggling because they've held traditional uh, models. Uh, you take something like the financial services industry, uh, for example. Now in Canada, it's, it's pretty good. And it turns out that we have a good regulatory environment that helped a lot. But, you know, Wall Street today, basically, their, their core behavior and their sort of operating model almost brought down the global capitalist system. And nothing has changed fundamentally. So that risk is still there. So this is a big problem, not just for, for the banking industry, but for everybody. Another area that you argue needs fundamental change is politics, that the politics mm -hmm. of old isn't really relative anymore. We just came through a federal election this year <laughs> and going into a provincial one in the fall. As you see it, what needs to change in the political landscape? Well, we have an old model of democracy. It's sort of called mass democracy. And it's, it came out of the industrial age. It was a big step forward than what we had before, kings and nobles uh, deciding everything. But we have mass production, mass distribution, mass media, mass education. You know, I'm a teacher, I have knowledge, you're a student, you don't. And the model of democracy is, you know, I'm a politician, listen to this 30 second negative ad and, and then you go vote for me and then I'm gonna broadcast to you for four years. But you're, you're a citizen as an audience. You know, you're a passive recipient of democracy. Well, you know, the, we created these representative institutions, but there was a weak public mandate and, and inert citizenry. We can now move to a, a new kind of democracy that's based on a culture of public deliberation and of active citizenship. I think most people would think of the change sort of starting with the Obama campaign of 2008 and sort of that yeah. embracing and harnessing that civic engagement. Is that the kind of stuff you're talking about that we need to see the shift going well, towards? Well, Obama changed the way you get elected, although I'm incredulous that three years later we have a Canadian election and not one of the political parties paid attention to that. I mean, it's like they had their head in the sands or something. Their web presence was websites. Here's Or what Twitter. 
Well, that was very limited what they did. It was mainly like, come to our website, learn about our policy, here's how you give money, and here's how you get involved. I'll, I'll tell you what happened with Obama that kind of woke me up. Someone sent me an email one day saying, you know this guy Obama, he thinks your book, Wikinomics, is the key to winning the presidency and changing America. Go to mybarackobama.com. So I went there, there's my book right cool. on the screen. Yeah, and we believe in the principles of the internet and collaboration, the book Wikinomics, and he's saying, I'm asking you to believe not just in my ability to bring about real change in Washington, I'm asking you to believe in yours. And, and I looked at that, well, my first reaction was, I am the man, <laughs> but it turns out I'm not the man, you see, because I went and I started looking around and there was a Wikinomics community, but there was also a single moms for daycare for Obama, and there was a New Yorkers for Obama, and a young firefighters for Obama. He created a platform whereby 35,000 communities self-organized, and that's what brought him to power. Three years later, all of our political parties ignored this. And what happened was that young people just self-organized by themselves out of the control of the parties. And the NDP was the big beneficiary of that because young people tend to be more le left wing. We have about five minutes left. I want to yeah. talk to you about something that you bring up when you do presentation things, and it's about the starlings in England doing something called yeah. murmuration, which is a beautiful sight in yeah. itself. But you apply that, uh, that image when what they're doing to macroeconomics. Explain the parallel there. Well, towards the end of the research for the book, uh, Anthony and I started wondering what would an age of networked intelligence look like? And we'd studied lots of human examples. We wondered, can nature tell us something? And we looked at... Uh, at uh, bees that come in swarms and fish come in in uh, schools and sheep come in flocks. Well, starlings come in something called a murmuration. And over the moors in England, in the cold winter nights, the starlings are out over a 20 mile radius doing their starling thing, foraging for food and so on. And at night, they come together and they create one of the most spectacular things in all of nature. We're seeing it right now. Yeah. Well, it's called a murmuration after the murmuring of the wings of the birds. And the murmuration has a function. It protects the birds. In these videos, you can see a predator trying to get at the birds, and the birds are chasing it away. The murmuration warms up the birds for the cold night ahead. And scientists that have studied this say they've never seen an accident. And there's no one leader. Leadership constantly changes. And to me, the murmuration is sort of an example of mass collaboration, in a sense. I mean, starlings aren't intelligent, and they don't have consciousness like humans do. This is more a, a, a conjoint, uh, a, a, a bunch of uh, impulses that are working together well. But humans are intelligent. And it made me wonder, is this just some fanciful analogy, or could we in fact, by hooking up our brains through these vast networks of glass and air, could we go beyond just sharing information and knowledge to create some kind of intelligence or even consciousness that transcends a, an individual, a group, a, an organization, a community, even out to society? And the murmuration functions according to the principles of of macroeconomics. There's collaboration, there's a sharing of information even about food sources, there's, there's an openness and there's a sort of interdependence like we should have in the, in the human world. I mean if there's one thing this crisis tells us it's that business can't succeed in a world that's failing. And there's kind of an integrity that the birds understand that through their collective strength that they can defend themselves. And I look at this murmuration, I think of those kids today in the streets of, uh, uh, of the Arab world that are taking a risk, that are, but they understand that they have collective power by working together. They know that if they give up, the old regime will hunt them down and will kill them in many of these countries. And so they, they need to combine their intelligence and their strength together, and they're using the internet and social media to do that. I get a lot of hope when I, when I look at this video I, that, that this smaller world our kids inherit may actually be a better one. We are going to talk a lot more about the kids of today here at home and abroad in the next few days. Thanks a lot, Don. My pleasure. Don Tapscott is the author of Macroeconomics and several other books. Tomorrow we're going to continue our conversation with Don and look at the net generation. Those are the kids who have grown up digital and how it's affecting how they live and work.